This is Rick Madsen from the University of Washington Shoulder and Elbow Service. We're talking about how to do a ream and run, and here are the final steps of that procedure. It's now time to prepare the proximal humerus. We use a cookie cutter to shape the metaphysis. We then broach the metaphysis with a the, uh, brooch of the same size as the cookie cutter. As we stated before, we want to make sure that we do not oversize that brooch because we don't want to run the risk of a fracture of the metaphysis here. If it looks as though the brooch is going to be too big, we can drop down a size and make up the difference with impaction grafting. When we trial the humeral component, we want to make sure that it goes back just about 50% with respect to the glenoid. We don't want a lot more, otherwise it's likely to be posteriorly unstable. If it's a lot less, it's likely to be too tight. We also don't want the humeral head to drop out the back when we lift the arm up, as is shown here. If that happens, we need to adjust the head thickness or perhaps use an anteriorly eccentric head. We also want to check and make sure that the patient can internally rotate about 60 degrees with the arm in 90 degrees of abduction. So again, if there is too much uh, posterior translation, we can address that either by increasing the thickness of the humeral component or by using an anteriorly offset humeral head as is shown here. If the biceps is damaged, we can do an inside-out biceps tenodesis, where the biceps is led through a hole in the proximal humerus and out the head cut. By putting the prosthesis into position, we can stabilize the biceps tendon securely. We have to be serious about the subscapularis repair. We put six suture holes and six sutures of number two non-absorbable suture through these holes. We then complete our impaction autografting and uh, add bone until the trial is very tight within the canal. If there is some problem with the positioning of the stem in the canal, we can selectively add graft, for example, in this situation to prevent varus uh, inclination of the stem. If the stem is too far to the back, we can add bone to the back, pushing it forward. Again, the nice thing about impaction autografting is that it's bone preserving and it has minimal uh, what's called filling ratio, which is the ratio of the diameter of the stem to the diameter of the humerus. Small stems give rise to less stress shielding and are less likely to give rise to humeral fracture at the tip of the prosthesis. Also, the nice thing about impaction autografting is it enables us to fit just about any size medullary canal, whether it's cylindrically shaped or funnel shaped, or if it's elliptical in cross section, or if there's been a previous plating of the uh, humeral shaft. When the component is inserted, we want to make sure it doesn't touch the skin to reduce the risk of cutie bacterium contamination. When we drive the prosthesis in, we want to make sure that it goes into where there is just a little bit of the neck cut showing above. We call that the berm. And here's a humeral component uh, just inserted exactly properly. We want to make sure that there is no unwanted um, bone contact between the uh, inferior aspect of the humerus and the glenoid and also want to make sure that there is no unwanted contact between bone in the back of the shoulder and the glenoid. We call this area poo corner and this phenomenon open booking. Once the prosthesis is in place, we repair the subscapularis securely. We check again to see how our range of motion and stability are coming. We'd like to have 40 degrees of external rotation with the subscapularis approximated to its attachment site, no more than 50% posterior translation, and 60 degrees of internal rotation with the arm out to the side. If there is too much posterior translation at this point, 
we can fine tune the operation by doing what's called a rotator interval plication, where we sew the anterior aspect of the supraspinatus to the upper aspect of the subscapularis. And uh, we do that usually using four sutures. Putting in more sutures or putting them more medially makes it additionally tight as, as necessary. It's very common, particularly in the young people that want to have a ream run operation to encounter what's called a B2 glenoid. That means it has a posterior uh, concavity here and that the glenoid is pointing backward. So these are the hallmarks of a B2 glenoid. An example is shown here. What we do in that situation is continue to ream the glenoid conservatively so we have a single concavity and we'll often use an anteriorly eccentric humeral head to prevent unwanted posterior translation. So here's a shoulder that's quite unstable before surgery. You can see the ball behind the back of the glenoid. Here it is after surgery using an anteriorly eccentric humeral head with more processes in front than in back that is nicely centered in the glenoid. Here's another example, again, of retroverted glenoid with posterior translation. Here's another example um, of a B2 glenoid. You can see the posterior translation uh, in the biconcave glenoid before surgery and the nice centering of the humeral head uh, in the glenoid afterwards. We don't use any interscaling blocks. We start assisted motion the day of surgery. And here's a gentleman who has achieved essentially full elevation one day after his surgery. We start uh, patient conducted exercises soon after surgery. These include um, exercises demonstrated by this gentleman two weeks after surgery. He's got forward flexion the pulley exercise, external rotation isometrics, and stretching and internal rotation in abduction. Here is x-rays before surgery and has a wonderful contouring of the glenoid after surgery. So in conclusion, the uh, Raymond Run offers a durable arthroplasty uh, that uh, enables the sh shoulder to engage in a whole range of activities without concern about uh, the risks of uh, polyethylene failure associated with the total shoulder. Here's a post-operative AP view, post-operative axillary view, showing nice contouring and nice regeneration of the articular surface after surgery. Again, it's durable, allowing a higher level of activity, such as chopping wood, and it can last uh, for many years um, and we're not sure what the exact length of the duration afterwards but many patients are now getting far beyond 10 years as shown in this example. Thank you.